David Williams here in Christ Jesus. We are focused on Jesus and his word, and hopefully you are focused on Jesus and his word today and forever. If you are focused on Jesus, you will see evidence that you are focused on on Jesus as described in the Bible. If you are a person who is dedicated to the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to see evidence that he accepts you as himself. Now, isn't that wonderful? Isn't that amazing? Aren't you glad about the fact that God not only accepts you, God accepts you as Jesus Christ. Now, that doesn't mean you are here to replace him. That doesn't mean you are going to replace the Savior. That doesn't mean he stops existing. That's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about fighting against Jesus. So we're not fighting against Jesus when we reveal the fact that God wants to call you Jesus. He wants to identify you as his very son. He's he's got one begotten son. And so he wants to see his son when he looks at you. The Bible plainly says that you were predestined to be conformed to the image of his dear son. I'm telling you, aren't you glad about the word of God today? Doesn't the word of God excite you? You should be excited. You should be delighted. You should be happy at the fact that God the Father wants to see you as Jesus Christ. And he will only accept you into his heavenly kingdom if he gets to see you as Jesus Christ. Now, it doesn't mean that you completely lose your identity, but it means that you become a part of his body. Yes, that's wonderful. You become a part of Jesus' body so the Father can recognize you as his son. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So that's an amazing thing to consider that the father wants to see you as Jesus Christ, but yet you'll still have a distinctive identity. Yet your name has to be written in the Lamb's book of life. So when the Father opens the Lamb's book of life, when the Son, when Jesus opens the Lamb's book of life, it's not going to say, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ. No, 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 no. Your name better be in the Lamb's book of life. But yet you've got to get in as Jesus Christ. How can this be? (coughs) How can I both be Jesus Christ and me. Oh, okay. Christ in me. Me in Christ. Christ in me. Me in Christ. So I've got to be Jesus. Jesus has to be me. I'm not going in unless the Father recognizes me as Jesus. But yet I've got to maintain the identity, the individual identity that I am. I am putting on Christ, Christ in me. My name has to be written in the Lamb's Book of Life. So there's an interesting balance there. There's an interesting reality to the fact that the Father needs to see himself in you. And yet... You've got, you've got to be in the Father. The Father wants to see his Son when he sees you, yet you have to appear before the Lord. So we're grateful at that balance, at that dynamic. Remember, you have this burning bush, and that's a very good picture here. That's a very good picture. So you have the fire engulfing the bush, but the bush is not being burned. 
that's you. That's you. The fire is engulfing the bush, yet the bush is not losing its composition. So that's Christ in you, Christ on you. That's what God wants to make you. Yes, you've got to be in Christ. Christ has to be in you. You've got to be in Jesus. Jesus has to be in you. The Father needs to see Jesus when he looks at you. And yet you have to be in the Father. So he is circumcising you, sanctif he's circumcising you, sanctifying you, filling you, empowering you, engulfing you. Isn't that good? Isn't that amazing? He says, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. You've got to have his name and he's got to have your name. He's got to recognize you. Jesus has to recognize you, but yet you've got to be recognized as him. So Christ in you, you are the righteousness of God. You are in Christ. You are hidden in Christ. This is too good to keep to ourselves. This is too good to be silent about. So we are going to focus on the lordship of Jesus. And uh, so we're preaching here uh, as God is going, is going to give us a good example of this in the man Abram. We're not going to go through Abram's story, but we are at least going to look at Genesis chapter 12. And we might do some other parts of Abraham's story because the man had encounters with God. The man had encounters with God and the Spirit of God leaves those encounters on record so that we can have encounters with God. So God leaves this record available so that we can engage the God they were engaging and have our own encounters. And as they experienced transformation, you've got to be transformed. So they were transformed by the Spirit of God you got to be transformed by the Spirit of God. What were we talking about yesterday? Today is January 16th, right? 2024. And we were talking yesterday about how the Spirit of God will visit you and elevate you. And with elevation comes, comes higher expectations that will in include greater adversity, but it'll also include greater blessing, greater protection. Will you have to exercise more patience? You will. But you'll have greater substance. You'll have patience as a substance. You'll have a greater ability to exercise patience. You might not feel like you do, but you do. If you are truly being elevated, if you are truly being promoted, if you are really encountering God, then you are growing in the love of God. You are growing in the fruit of the Spirit of God. You are growing in the nature of the God that you are encountering. That's why First John can say that if I sin, I have not seen God. It says, if you sin, you haven't seen God. What's God saying there? He's saying, if you, if you are not consciously making decisions to obey the voice of God that you hear, because Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. If you are not consciously making decisions to obey the Lord, the Lord is saying, the depth at which you are supposed to, to see me, you're blind at that depth. You are blind at that depth. So it's not as though you aren't having certain experiences. But Jesus is saying, the, the you, the version or the part of you that's supposed to be seeing him, that part of you is not seeing him because you can make these decisions over here. 
that are completely contrary to your identity in Christ. And so that's not God's will. But we're, we're here in Genesis 12, and we're going to look through this. This is, this is going to be a passage of beauty. This is going to be a beautiful passage where we're going to get to see God guide someone. And remember, because the scripture is not telling us how clear this appearance, it's not telling us how vivid this encounter was. It's not giving us the details of Abram's encounter with God. It's not telling us if his encounter with God came in the form of a thought. It's not telling us if his encounter with God came in the form of a dream. So when you read Jacob's encounter with the Lord, it's very specific as to how it describes his encounter with God. When you, hear, when you read about Moses' encounter with God, it's specific. We know that there was a, an actual manifestation of the angel of God as a flame of fire on a bush. So we get that picture. But when it comes to Abram's first encounter with Almighty God by his spirit, it doesn't explain to us what that encounter looked like. It doesn't say if he came in the form of a dream or if it was an open vision, if he heard an audible voice, if it came in the form of thoughts. It doesn't specify if it came in the form of a man, if the angel manifested, because we do, we see that. We see that over there in Genesis chapter 18, where the Spirit of God appeared to Abram, to Abraham, and he came in the form of a human. So we don't get to see that. We don't, we don't know how he, how God appeared to him. But what we do know is that this appearance was legitimate. We know that it happened. We know that it began to determine what decisions he was making. It began to determine what choices he was making. We like how it says it back here in Hebrews chapter 11. And it's talking about Abraham, and it introduces him here. In Hebrews 11, verse 8, by faith Abraham, when he was called to go out to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out not knowing where he went. And he went out not knowing where he went. And so it tells us that he didn't know specifically where the Lord was taking him. It says he didn't specifically know where God was taking him. Spirit of God, where are you taking me? He didn't specifically know which place he'd go to, but he knew that he was supposed to leave his family. Now, yesterday we talked about a passage here in 1 Peter Chapter 1, I think, if it's not in chapter 1, it might be in chapter 2. But he talks about the, look at this here. This is one part of it. This is First Peter chapter 1, verse 13. First Peter 1, 13. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of of Jesus Christ as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance, but as he which has called you is holy, so be you holy in all manner of conversation. Okay, we just found where the rest of it says where it sa says what it says. Verse 17 says this, and if you call on the Father who without respect of persons judges according to every man's work, past the time of your sojourning here, in fear, for as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. All right, so now we just discovered that we are picking up 
the behaviors, the sinful behaviors that we learned from our fathers. That's what it's saying. It's saying that you are doing what you saw done. That's what it's saying. It's saying that in your flesh, you are doing what you saw your parent or parents doing. You are doing what those who came before you positioned and set you to do. So further up in verse 14, he talks about the responsibility to obey the voice of God as he speaks to you. So the Spirit of God is commanding that you obey his voice and that you live that way. Live complying with my word. Live according to my will for your life. Don't behave as your fathers behaved. Don't behave as the people in your world are behaving. We need to be able to distinguish the, the saints of God from the ain'ts of God. We need to be able to distinguish the righteous from the ungodly, the holy from the profane. We need to be able to, to, to distinguish that. We've, we need to be able to distinguish that. And so he's saying that we've got to live as obedient children and we can't take on, we can't return to the, the, the behaviors that we initially had when we first met Christ Jesus. If you are not yet committed to Jesus, the Spirit of God describes your works as lustful ignorance. If you are presently not devoted to Jesus, the Holy Ghost identifies, the God that created you identifies your behaviors as lustful ignorance, meaning you are being driven by your desires and you don't know where your desires are taking you. You don't know what the end result of your decisions are going to be. So that's what he's describing when he talks about lustful ignorance. And he talks about this being what you used to be. Now, who is he talking to? He's talking to a people who have repented, a people who have departed from the ungodly behaviors of their world. That's what he's talking about. He's talking about saved, or he's talking to saved people. If you are not yet saved, you need to get saved. You need to be born again. You need to make the decision today to commit your life to Jesus. You need to make the decision today to commit your life to Jesus and to grow as a Christian. Today is the day of salvation. But if you identify as saved, if you believe that you are saved, if you call yourself a Christian, there should be a distinction between what you do now and what you did before you committed to Christ Jesus. Now, isn't that a shock? Isn't that contrary to many of the popular teachings that we are hearing in this generation? Aren't you being taught by the most popular people that God loves you as you are? But that's not what the Holy Ghost is saying. That's not what we're going to see in Abram's life. That's not what you are going to see in the lives of any person who is identified as a holy brother. Wherefore, holy brothers, partakers of the heavenly calling. So he's talking to us as a people who are obligated to be different. Yes, and you are obligated to be different from different than what you used to be. Oh man, isn't that amazing? You are obligated to be different than you used to be. If you want to spend forever with God, you got to go on the journey of different. Yes, you do. 
You've got to go on the journey of different. You are traveling through this world in its condition. You are required to be gradually changing from what you were before you committed to Christ to what the Spirit of God requires that you be. So you are obligated of God to be progressively different from what you were before you committed to Jesus. You're obligated. That's the will of God. And he needs to transform you. It is gradual. It's ongoing, believers. It's ongoing. If you are a believer in Christ Jesus, if you want to rest in peace, if you want to spend eternity with Almighty God, respect the fact that you are obligated to be gradually changing in your heart and in your mind, in your thinking pattern, in your desires. Yes, you are obligated of God to be gradually developing. Your sensitivity to the voice of God should be getting sharper. Yes, that's true. Your obedience to the word of God as you know it should be getting greater. We're excited about this because there are blessings. There's power available to those who are surrendering their lives to Jesus. So we're very excited. We are excited. I'm telling you, we're excited about the glory of God, about the love of God. We're excited. We are full of hope. I'm telling you, we're full of hope. Because God is doing some great things. He's doing some great things. He is and will be doing some great things. And so right here, I mean, there's so much good doctrine here. My goodness, I think we might have to walk through First Peter. We might just have to do it. I mean, I think you're compelling me. I think I'm being compelled. But for right now, we'll try to finish out, if it be God's will, Genesis chapter 12, because there's much doctrine there. But he tells us that we can't be what we were when we met Christ. He tells us that our thinking pattern, our attitudes, the condition of our hearts needs to gradually change from year to year. From year to year, there needs to be gradual change, believers. From year to year, there needs to be gradual change, gradual growth, gradual development. The things I used to do, I do them no more. There needs to be gradual transformation. That is how we'll know that the Holy Ghost is at work in our lives. If we are not gradually growing, if we are not gradually obeying at greater levels, if we are not gradually experiencing more of the power, more of the knowledge, more of the impact of our faith, then the Lord says we are not disciples. He says in John 15 that we are to continuously bring forth fruit. This is what it says right here in verse 8. This is John 15, 7 and 8. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you will and it will be done to you. Herein or in this is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit so will you be my disciples. In this manner will you be my disciples. So we know we are disciples as we gain greater impact. As we gain greater impact. He's talking about answered prayer. He's talking about our prayers being answered more frequently with greater regularity. Jesus is saying that we've got to have progressive evidence that we are sons of God. I can't just say that I am a son of God. Now, I can. But Jesus said, not everyone that says, Lord, 
Lord will enter into his kingdom. But those who do the will, Brother David, how will I know that I am doing the will? There are specific promises that God makes to men. God makes people promises. And he says, the way that you'll know that you are doing my will is that you will have specific things happen in your life as a result of obeying my voice. That's what he's saying with great plainness of speech. He says, no, you've got to bear fruit. It doesn't matter that you are a fig tree if you aren't bearing fruit. If you are not bearing figs, if you are a fig tree, if you are an apple tree, if you are a pear tree, you must grow pears yearly. Yes, yearly you must grow pears. There must be evidence that others can eat from. There must be evidence that you are a pear tree. The leaves won't do. The bark type won't do. So he doesn't simply say that you are a son of God if you have a certain measure or a certain condition that identifies you as a pear tree, as a fig tree, as an olive tree, if olives grow on trees. So the Lord says there has to be manifest evidence that you are a son. How do we know that Jesus Christ was the Messiah? He, he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil, and then he died and rose again. So there were things that it was said that he would do as evidence that he was the Savior of the world. So Jesus right here in John 8 says the fact that we can develop much, see that word there, much fruit, that's our basis for being disciples. He's saying you are a disciple if you can produce much fruit. That's not supposed to scare you. He's not trying to disqualify you. He's not trying to scorn you. He's saying, obey my voice and you will bear fruit. If you, dis if you are not bearing fruit, it's because you are not obeying his word. If you are not fruit bearing, it's because you are not obeying. It's as simple as that. If you do what he tells you to do, there are promises in his word that you are going to realize, that are going to manifest in your life. Genesis chapter 12 is a record of this type of thing. Again, we are glad about it. But how does he start off? He says, well, this starts off with you turning from the traditions of your parents. That's what he's going to do with our father of faith, as the word of God describes Abraham to be. The Bible says you are a child of Abraham by faith. Didn't you read that? I mean, again, I hope you like it, beloved, because it's true. It's true. Yeah, let me read this to you. This is Genesis, This is Galatians chapter 3, verse 26. This, the, I, I'm going to give you two passages that are going to help you out concerning your identity as a seed of Abraham. So this is Galatians chapter 3, and verse 26 says, For you are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. 
for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Here we go. Here we go. Slow down the bus. Slow the bus down. Let's get verse 29 in there. And if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Oh, he just helped us out. He just helped us out. Yes, but there are people who are foolish enough to reject Paul's writings. Did you know that there, you know that there are people who say that Paul's writings should not be in the Bible? Well, did Jesus, the Savior of the world, say anything like this? Did Jesus also tell us that we are related to Abraham in any way? Well, let's go over to John chapter 8. Let's get some words in red. Let's get some words in red here. This is John 8, verse <coughs> 37. We can start at verse 36 because we love verse 36. If the Son, therefore, will make you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are Abraham's seed, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak that which I have seen with my father, and you do that which you have seen with your father. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Wait, wait, stop. Again, we need to make, the, the bus has to slow down. Bus driver, don't drive so fast. I need, I need to get on. Come on, I'm standing out here. It's raining. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man that has told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. So he's telling them that if you are Abraham's child, you'll behave like Abraham. We just learned over in heat. Now, so this is, this, this, this is not Paul talking for those who want to dismiss Paul. This is not Paul talking. This is the Christ. This is the Redeemer talking. And he says that, that if we behave like Abraham, we are his children. If we act like Abraham, we are his children. Well, what thing did Abraham do? Well... Jesus said this in verse 56. He said, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day and he saw it and was glad. Jesus just told us that Abraham was glad to see Jesus come. Jesus said Abraham was glad to, to know what Jesus would do. That Abraham was glad to see Jesus work. Yeah, this is telling us that Abraham was a lover of Jesus Christ. Yeah. And so if we love Jesus, we're acting like Abraham. If we don't love Jesus, we're not acting like Abraham. So we are Abraham's seed. And so that's why this is such a, a necessary reference over here in Genesis chapter 12. Because the same expectations, listen clearly, the same expectations that God has had for Abraham, he has for you in a figure. The same expectations that he has for Abraham... He has for you. If you are in Christ, you are Abraham's seed. And the promises he made to Abraham, you have access to. And so we are considering what promises Jesus made to Abraham. What did God promise Abraham? What were God's expectations for Abraham? 
as we evaluate that, we'll be able to hear Jesus. We'll be able to hear that what God was requiring of Abraham, he's requiring of all of those who would be justified or made innocent, redeemed, or rescued. All of us have to behave as Abraham behaved in that Abraham was encountering the true God, the everlasting God, the almighty God, the one God of all of heaven and earth. So that one God appears to man. The one spirit of God appears to man. And as he appears to man, he sets expectations for who that man ought to be. He doesn't just set expectations, though. He also makes promises. He's not just telling people what to do. He's telling them what they stand, what they have to gain from obeying his voice. He's saying, I am going to tell you what to do, and I'm going to make you promises for doing it. He's not telling you to seek him in vain. He's not telling you that you aren't going to prosper as a result of pursuing him. No, he's not just making demands and giving commands. He's making promises everywhere he's commanding you to behave in any particular way. He's also promising you various types of his goodness. Various types of his goodness. And we're going to get to read some of that right here in Genesis chapter 12. But you've got to read the instruction. How can I gain access to the promises of God? He starts off in this way. Now the Lord had said to Abram, get you out of your country and from your kindred and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. All right. So this starts off with a command to separate from the place and the people that would keep him in a certain condition. Yeah. People will attack the ministers of the gospel because the ministers of the gospel are commanding people to withdraw themselves from any person who prevents them from being as God commands them to be. This is what Jesus taught often. If any man come to me, he must deny himself. He must take up his cross and follow me. He's got to hate his father. He's got to hate his mother. He's got to hate his spouse. He's got to hate his children. He's got to hate his brother. He's got to hate his sister. And he's got to hate his own life in order to be my disciple. In order to be my disciple, he's got to be able to distinguish between me and them. Yes, but Lord, let me go and bury my father. Jesus said, the rest of your family, I classify them as dead people. They are not kingdom useful. Let them bury your father. Your father is no longer useful in this world. Your family members are not useful to the Lord in their condition. They've got nothing better to do. You do. Let your dead family bury your dead father. Man, now isn't that insulting? Isn't that scorning? Oh, he scorned me. Jesus just told that man that his ministry responsibilities outweighed his domestic responsibilities. Oh, man. Oh, man. What just happened? The Holy Ghost has told these people that, well, if you've got responsibilities in the kingdom, that comes before. 
for your domestic responsibilities. Oh, man. Oh, man, yeah. I, I tell you what. Yeah, I, 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 I'm in the book. He's in the book. That's what Brother Cedric is saying. Preach, doctor. Do doctor. Doctor, you're preaching. I don't know if you've ever heard anyone say that. That's strange. And it's funny when you hear someone say that. Doctor, you're preaching, doctor. Doctor. You know what I mean? You're a doctor. You're a doctor. You're just dissecting. You're breaking it down. Yes, because this is the truth, beloved. This is the truth. We're, 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 we're preaching the truth. It's, it's, it's right here. It's all written down for us by the Holy Ghost. It's all written down. We're excited about it. We're excited about it. We're excited about this. No, we, 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 we say, even so come quickly. The Spirit and the Bride say come. The Spirit and the Bride say come. No, no, no. The Spirit and the Bride say come. So we, 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 we love His glorious appearance. And so he says, to start your faith, Abraham, listen, we, we, we can't mix your faith with your family group. Now, not everyone is going to be required to physically do this. The, 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 the jailer there in Philippians 16 and Cornelius over there in Acts, cha I'm sorry, Acts chapter 16, Acts chapter 10, the, 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 the Philippian jailer the Lord was merciful enough to save his house, meaning his household. And in Cornelius' life, the Lord saved his family. That is not generally what the Lord does. That is an unusual work. Jesus made that very clear in Matthew chapter 10. The old covenant, this is a very basic principle in God's word. So anyone who denies that, is simply denying the Lord that bought them. Because God wants you to know that there are certain changes that you cannot make with the company that you've known from your past life. Abraham was an idolater. He was a moral man, but his family served false gods. His family served false gods. And the Lord is telling Abraham that in order to inherit these promises, you've got to separate from the people that you know because those people, they don't obey me. They don't love me. They don't obey me. But Abram, we need you right now. Father has just died. Father has just died. If we never needed you before, we need you now. Yeah. Abraham's brother died. He had, you know, a couple of brothers. Abraham, Nahor, and Haran. So Terah is their father. Terah had three sons on record. Abraham Nahor and Haran. And Haran died. He died. So that shrinks the family and creates a level of instability. And then Terah dies. Then Terah dies. And now it's just Abraham and his wife and their servants. And then they've got Nahor and his son Bethuel and, you know, his wife. And then you've got some other people. So Terah dies. And before that, Haran dies. The family needs him. This is not time to split the family. This is time for the family to come together, to plan. That's what this is time for. And in the midst of that, the Spirit of God says to Abram, leave your country. Leave your country. Leave your family. Leave your father's house. I want to take you to where I say you should be. But Lord, 
What about my family, my brother Nahor? He's essentially all alone. Yes, he's got some servants here. Yes, he's got a son, but he needs me. Our other brother died and our father just died. He needs me. He needs my support. He needs my efforts. He needs my resources. We know we, we, we've got to survive as a group. The Spirit of God says, get up and leave. Oh, man. Is God inconsiderate? Is God inconsiderate? Or is, are there higher expectations? Is God not considerate of the man's familial needs? Or does God have greater expectations for him? Guess what, beloved? God has greater expectations for all of those in Christ Jesus. Let the dead bury the dead. Wait, Jesus, what are you saying about my family? I'm saying that in their condition, they are worth less. Oh, 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 man. Oh, man. That's, that's a hard pill to swallow. That's a football-sized pill to swallow. You want me to swallow a football? Well, you're, you're obligated. You're obligated. You're obligated. But Lord... Let me at least tell my family goodbye. Since you're calling me into the ministry, Jesus, let me at least run home really quickly. You let Andrew run over and get Peter. You let Andrew leave and run and get Peter, and he brought him. Let me go and say goodbye to my family. Jesus tells that man, and wherever I'm quoting this, it is the last verse in that chapter, it is the last verse to underscore the high purposes of the kingdom. It's the last verse in that chapter. What does it say? If any man puts his hand to the plow and looks back, he's not fit for the kingdom. That guy you cannot use. Oh. He just shrank your discipleship group. He shrank your church. He shrank your friend group. He shrank those who have access to eternal life. Jesus just said, the man simply said to Jesus, Lord, can I find that for you? Can we find, is it in the Bible? Where is it? I mean, we've got to know if that, is that in the Bible? I mean, my goodness, where is it? Because we, we, we want to know if it's in here. It might be in chapter 9. Let's see if we can find this in God's holy Bible. Is it at the end of chapter 9? Where is this? Oh, man, it's in chapter 9. Now, what are we going to read here? All right. Verse 57. This is 957. And it came to pass that as we went in the way... A certain man said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests. But the son of man has not where to lay his head. What's he doing? He's challenging that man's sincerity. He's challenging the man's sincerity. Oh, you say you'll follow me wherever I'm going? Well, I want you to know, I want you to know that the conditions are likely to be adverse. Oh, whoa, whoa. Slow down. No, 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 no. I want you to know because I hear your enthusiasm. Jesus is not simply looking for the initially or superficially enthusiastic. No. You don't need stony ground in the discipleship, beloved. I know you want many people to be following you and to be packing the church. But Jesus said you don't need the stony ground. 
And so Jesus teaches in a way that identifies the ground. Jesus can identify who he's talking to. And Jesus will, will talk in a way that exposes his audience for what they are. Aren't we glad about it? Jesus speaks in a way that exposes his audience for what they are. Don't you think that numbers matter in that numbers increase the likelihood of success? Don't you think that numbers increase the likelihood of success and prosperity? Well, Jesus Christ says, no, because if you have the wrong people in the midst of the right people, then It'll manifest pollution and corruption, hindering the effectiveness of the work. He says, no, no, no. You, it's better to be on one accord than to have a house full of strife. Jonathan says, there is no restraint with God to save, <coughs> to save by many or by few. He says, no, 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 no. God can deliver with 32,000 or with 300. There is no, there's no limitation to the strength of the Lord to save by many or by few. We see those, that truth many times in God's word here. No, no, no. God can save by many or by few. All right, so Jesus is not simply satisfied with the amount of people who say they love him. No, Jesus will weed out those who are not sincere by the way he communicates. By the way he communicates, the, the Jesus of the Bible will weed out the superficially enthusiastic from the committed. Yes. Jesus is not impressed with the crowd. Jesus sanctifies the crowd. How does he do that? He says things that are going to push you to make a decision completely for him or completely against him. Jesus, in that regard, the world would describe him as polarizing. That's what the world would describe him as. That's what our generation of people would describe Jesus as polarizing. You're either going to love him when you hear him preach or you're going to despise him. One of the two. Now, he's not going to be unnecessarily offensive, but he's not going to be passive, nor is he going to justify the wicked. He's not doing that either. He's not doing that either. So what does he do? What does he do? The man says to him, Lord, I'll follow you wherever you go. Now, doesn't that sound encouraging as a leader, as a minister? Can you imagine as a man of God, as a woman of God, what if someone were to come to you and say, I'll follow you no matter where you go? That might stimulate your sense of accomplishment and success. Now, see, this is what I want to hear. I want to hear someone say, they'll follow me wherever I go. Is that how Jesus handled this? No. Jesus communicated with people in a way that proved that, his, that he had higher standards. Jesus prayed. He thanked the Father for giving him those who belonged to him. Father, I am praying for those that are mine. He's revealing the fact that not everyone that comes to me is mine. I can't retain everyone that comes. Because they are not all sincere. May the grace of God be on all of those who love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Oh, don't you love that word sincerity? Doesn't it help you 
doesn't it root out some things? No, I know that you want to say that you are friends with him. But Jesus said, my friends do everything I tell them to do. So don't just say that you are my friend. This is not social media. If you don't do everything I tell you to do, I don't identify you as a friend. Now, you can call Jesus your friend all day. The question isn't whether you call Jesus your friend. The question is whether he calls you his. Oh, absolutely. No, Abraham was called a friend of God. Abraham was called a friend of God. Yeah. Unless, of course, Jesus wants to be facetious and call you a friend like he did Judas Iscariot. Friend, why are you coming? Okay, so now he's just doing that. Okay, so now this is Ezekiel 14 manifest before our eyes. So you know right now what he's doing right now is he's just... He's acting dumb. Friend, what are you doing here? So the man says, Lord, I'll follow you wherever you go. Jesus says, you're not sincere. Jesus says, the way that you know that you are sincere is your willingness to endure. That's what he says. Oh, Lord, I'll follow you wherever you go. Well, I'll tell you this. The foxes are going to live better than I am under certain conditions. The birds will have more stability at times than me. Is that what you're willing to endure? Jesus is saying that he's recruiting those who will endure. No, 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 you've got to endure to the end. No, I, I, I don't need the superficial fanatic. I don't need someone who simply says that they're going to follow me. I need someone who is going to be there through my temptations. You are they who have continued with me through my temptations. And I point unto you a kingdom as my father appointed to me. So this man says, Lord, I'll follow you wherever you go. And he says, well, I don't think that you are sincere. And to prove that, I want to tell you that I am going to be in conditions that will be hard on the body. I don't think that you are sincere enough to be with me under those conditions. So let me just tell you outright what's up ahead. Let me tell you outright what's up ahead. Isn't he merciful? He demands that we count the cost. No, well, you do know we are going through some adverse situations. We're going to prosper. We're going to win. But there will be adversity along the way. So he says that to that man. And he says to another, follow me. Now, this guy here, he's going to pick. So now, this guy said he's going to follow Jesus. But Jesus turns to that one and says, you, follow me. I want you to follow me. He says, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Isn't that a very important relationship between a father and a son? Jesus said to him, let the dead bury the dead. But go you and preach the kingdom of God. Jesus said, you've got greater responsibilities. My family needs me. He says, you've got greater responsibilities. Your father's already dead. Your brother, your siblings, your mom, those are dead people. Let them handle that. Let them handle that. You've got greater responsibility. You are ordained to preach. You are ordained to preach. Jesus is saying that your responsibilities to preach outweigh your domestic responsibilities. Yeah. No, 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 no. Leave them to that. I want you to go with me where I'm going and do what I'm doing. Yeah, that really attacks an idol. That attacks 
and idol. And then lastly, another also said, Lord, I will follow you, but uh, let me go and just say farewell, which are at home at my house. I just want to tell them, if what if they're looking for me? What if they wonder about where I am? What if they're concerned about my whereabouts? I want them. I just want, I don't know when I'll see them again. Just let me go and tell them goodbye. I just want to say goodbye. Can't I just say goodbye? I mean, how pressing is this? How how obligated am I? I mean, what's the rush? I just want to say goodbye. They're right there. I'll be back. I, I will follow you. But let me first go and tell my family at my house goodbye. I, I, I'm going. I'm not that first guy. I can endure, but I just want to tell my family goodbye. It'll be quick, I promise. And Jesus says to that man, he says, no person who starts to do my work and second guesses whether he should be doing this is qualified for the kingdom. Is that the Bible? He says, watch that second guessing. That's what Jesus did. That's in red, beloved. I don't know if you can see that. That's in blood red right there. He says, yeah, man, so you are playing with your qualifications. He says, you are, you are, you are, you're rewriting your resume right now. You do know that. You do know that by asking me that, you are telling me that you are not qualified. You're telling me that you are double-minded and under adverse conditions, you are likely to withdraw. That's what you're telling me. You're telling me that you have idols that you are likely in a moment to bow to when I need you to be focused on the purposes of the kingdom of God. That's what you're telling me. You're telling me that in a firefight, you might not pull the trigger. In a firefight, you might not have my back. That's what you're telling me. Because what we're about to do is life or death. People's lives, their eternity depends on our commitment. Their eternity depends on our commitment. He says, oh, so you're telling me that in the thick of it, you might miss your family? You're telling me that you might want to go back? Oh, well, then you, lo you, you anyone who's that way is not qualified. Because to be qualified, there has to be a heart position. Oh, you want this glory, do you? You want answered prayer. Is that what you want? You want, you, you, want me to, you want me to hear you when you call? You want answered prayer, do you? You want eternal life, do you? That's what he's telling Abraham. Are you a child of Abraham? Okay. Well... The word of God says that if you are a seed of Abraham, you will do what Abraham did. You will do what Abraham did. Yeah, you can dress it up and all, all you like. Yeah, you can pretend like that's not the Old and the New Testament all day. You can just shut your eyes and read the Bible. Or, you know, I don't know. I don't know how many uh, versions you can come up with to lie on Jesus. But this is, this is red, brothers. I understand that you have many choices when it comes to preachers and teachers. 
and commentaries and the Greek. Well, you know, the original Greek says, you're a liar. You're a liar. You are one of those people who lie. You are one of the bad people that we are all commanded of Jesus Christ to beware of. Okay. So what the guy did was he just twisted the scripture, took it back to the original. Well, he's talking to someone who's there. Well, you, you speak Hebrew, don't you? Well, let me say it to you in a way that you can understand. If you don't commit, you are not fit. How about that one? Yeah, how about that? So he says, he says, I don't need the numbers, brothers. I need the committed. He says, I don't need the numbers. I need the devoted. I don't need the numbers. 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 Because many times, the more people you have, you, 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 you tamper with the glory. You tamper with the miracle. If Jesus wants to resurrect this guy's daughter, he's got to put the people who are fearful out of the room. I've got too many people in here. And he wants to take Peter, James, and John with him to do this. I've got too many people here. Too many people? Yeah. They'll stop the glory. There's too much unbelief here. There's too much unbelief here. There's too much doubt here. But the, but the, but the, no, 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 no. I need, I'll take one of a city and two of a family. Yeah. Yeah. He says, if you are really Abraham's seed, you'll make the decisions Abraham made. So that's less, that's faith. Lesson number one. Faith lesson number one. Oh yeah, you got to abandon your family when your obligations to serve require that you do what the family isn't doing. 